<laughs> Excuse me. Can we start, please? Thank you. Welcome all to the Infrastructure Services and Networks Committee meeting at one o'clock um, today. I have there is no public forum today. I have apologies from Mayor Carl. Councillors Staines, Vandivas and Lafiso, and I think one for lateness from Vincent Pope, because I know he was in the room. Um, thank you. A anyone uh, second it? Thank you. Um, all in favour, please say aye. aye. Against, carried. Confirmation of gender. I'll move that we confirm the agenda with the following alteration in regard to Standing Order 2.1, Option C, be adopted in relation to moving and seconding and speaking to amendments. Seconded, Councillor O'Malley. Any discussion? <laughs> All in favour, please say aye. aye. Against, carried. Thank you. Declaration of interests. I imagine you'll, if anyone has any other amendments, please let the GSOs know. Um, and I'll move that the committee notes the elected members interest register attached and confirms the proposed management plan for elected members interest. Seconded, Councillor Hawkins. All in f any discussion? <laughs> All in favour, please say aye. aye. Against, carried, thank you. Transport activity report, Mr Saunders. Thank you for your report. Do you wish to speak to it or are you happy just to take questions? Uh, just uh, happy to take questions. Just one note. Um, there's a date. I'll just sort of, um, it's incorrect. Uh, paragraph 7, that should read 30 April, not 1 April. Yep. Other than that, uh, happy to take questions. Thank you. Councillor Hawkins. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you, Mr Saunders. That's exactly where my questions are, um, paragraph 7. Um, and do I take that paragraph to mean that the relationship, the, the original, the existing contract, which would have had rights of renewal, um, those rights of renewal aren't being automatically exercised in this case? Uh, that's correct. So the original contract had the option of two one-year rights of renewal. Um, so it was a three-year contract with the possibility of two single years. Uh, we have extended it by, uh, we've taken 10 months. Uh, 10 months of that first one year right of renewal, we've extended it by 10 months just working through when the appropriate date to start a new contract was. Uh, so they've, they've received um, an additional right of renewal of 10 months and then we'll be entering into a new contract after that. Um, my, my second question is around the tertiary precinct work. Um, you may or may not be aware of um, should you be sad enough to still follow student politics. But in the OUSA referendum last week, one of the questions was around uh, a pedestrian access across Albany Street, given that there's no legitimate pedestrian crossing north-south or east-west between Cumberland Street and Anzac Avenue, which has been exacerbated by the rerouting of the traffic because the Dundas Street Bridge work. But um, is where in the work programme does, would that, I mean, are staff aware of that issue and is any work being done to try and uh, mitigate that? Uh, yes, we, we are aware through conversations with the university around their um, safety concerns on Albany Street. So obviously that's a um, big part of that safety and accessibility work that's um, underpinning the tertiary precinct. Uh, and But in, in terms of what could happen in the near or in, sooner than the, the long-term upgrades, which are still um, a number of years away, uh, we had looked at the option of formal crossings uh, previously and, and there are... Um, there's some challenges there just in terms of the, the volume of students coming out at, and where they cross, which is essentially that whole, you know, almost the length between uh, Clyde and Albany. They, they, they come out of a number of entranceways and cross, so there, there is some challenge about where to locate it uh, or whether a slower speed environment um, where they're able to cross at will as they currently do is a better option. So the safety team is still having a look at it. We still discuss it as part of the tertiary precinct work, but there is no firm plans to put in any improvements there in, in the short term. Would it be a, I mean, the, the slow speed option would be rendered moot, wouldn't it, if there was a steady stream of traffic going at slower speeds that still doesn't solve the crossing challenge? 
Yeah, that's correct. So certainly the the uh, diversion or detour with the traffic manager down Dunder Street has changed the environment in Albany. Um, and when that Dunder Street work is completed and it uh, and Dunder Street opens up again for traffic, we we will monitor to see whether Albany movements go back to pre-work or whether it actually has changed people's traffic patterns long term. Because our, your intention isn't for that temporary roundabout that's been included as part of that mitigation to remain there, or is that still an open question? Uh, I, that's still an open question. Um, we've had good feedback on that. That Those intersections, uh, that one and a number of those around that Clyde 4th Street, Albany Street, Union Street, are, um, are not safe intersections, and that roundabout has been operating um, successfully through the trial, so uh, it's still an open question as to whether it's left there at this stage. Because that could potentially um, encourage people who are now using that route who wouldn't have previously to continue doing so regardless of the Dundas Street Bridge work being finished? Uh, it could do, depending on where they're, where they're coming from or going to. It's a fairly substantial detour if you're coming or going to the north um, to get all the way around the tertiary precinct and then um, and then bit to where you're going. So I think it would be... I would imagine that people coming and going from the north um, will go back to using Dunder Street. Thank you. Councillor Lord. Thank you, Chair. Um, Richard, I just noticed actually in point three, uh, or paragraph three, one of the physical works to appear the road network following the July 17 event is nearing completion, and you had there that the cost sitting at 10.6. Now, I thought we'd had, and that includes the Mount Ross Bridge, which obviously was a dearer option than we originally had perhaps thought. I thought we were up nearly 10, excluding the bridge. Was that not the case? Had I? Uh, that's, that number's this calendar year. Oh, so, okay, the, yeah, yeah. the overall package uh, is, well, I don't want to give a number. Paragraph 35. Oh, there we go. Thanks, Councillor. Uh, yeah, there we go. So uh, estimated 21 and um, to date about 18. So oh, the, the 10 just refers to this year. This year, yeah. No, that's good. Thank you. Councillor O'Malley. Just following up on that, um, so those are almost all rural road repairs, are they? Like in terms of how much of that 17 million would be rural versus urban? Oh, significantly more. Rural, like I couldn't give you a percentage, but the the majority of it, uh, the peninsula was uh, is always hard hit in weather events. Uh, there was there were substantial works, obviously even excluding the the big bridge in Middlemarch, mm -hmm. uh, and the North Coast uh, Coast Road uh, was also. So generally, we 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 do get um, significant works within the urban um, area as well. But I think overall, the high percentage have been the rural. So. And I'm just going to paragraph 14 now on something completely different. The CSA um, response is there, and then that dropped to 63% in April, and it's put down to an administrative error. Yeah, there was. So there, there's a um, function there where they transfer those requests um, within their system to uh, contractors. They were picking the jobs up and, and assessing them, but they weren't transferring them within the system. So technically, they weren't complying with the, the KPI, which is why the score has occurred, but the jobs were being seen to by the contractors. Yeah, that's right. And then just another one of those kind of comparing graphs. Um, the TMP audit results, when you've got DCC audits and downer audits on the same dates, that are presumably they around the same jobs. So when you compare, oh, so um, page 21, top of page 21, the, the graph there. Because um, just roughly looking, it looks like downer scored itself a little bit better than the DCC up until about midway through the year, and then it looks like there's some change. Has there been any change in the feedback to the TMP audits? Uh, so the TMP audits is, uh, just to explain this, so our, our staff undertake a number um, per month, uh, and then one of the um, priorities, obviously, for Downer um, on the network is safety, so they undertook to bring their own auditor in, and they provide those results to us. So they're, they're not shared audits, and they're not the same sites. They're, they're a selection that our staff make based on where they are at the time and what contracts they have working, and then a selection down a take. Uh, so, I, I, and obviously we like to see positive results, but for me the fact that down are even with their own audits of picking up issues that will help them improve is a positive thing, rather than us just seeing a, a sort of clean slate of green uh, right through there. Oh no, that, that actually was my point, that Downer appeared to be picking up more negative 
reports on themselves as the year progressed, and I was wondering if that was a feedback, but it's just, just quite literally random in some respects. Of it. Thanks. Councillor Gary. Thank you. Um, Mr Saunders, uh, just on that safety matter, uh, I've got about three questions. Um, 22C, banned item was being used on site vehicle. What kind of banned item are we talking about? Uh, I can read it out, but I probably can't tell you what it is. <laughs> uh, someone else might. Uh, so it was a fixed level action load binder, which is essentially a restraint device used for fastening down vehicle loads. Yeah, so it's a tie down and it wasn't up to spec, so they changed it. Oh, okay, yeah. so it wasn't up to spec. All right, uh, thank you. Um, and uh, item 30, um, you'll be aware of, of how instantly popular the Peninsula Connection has been with immediate use by lots of people. Um, but I have noticed just today that there's a speed counter so that you can see what speed you're doing as you come along, um, the 30k section. Um, is, there a, is there an issue with people going too fast through that area? Is that, sorry, just to clarify, is that within um, stage two where they're currently working? Where they're currently working right now. Right. Uh, and uh, I haven't seen it before. Yeah. It's just today. No, I'm not, a, I'm, I'm not aware. Um, it may be action that the contractors have taken as part of their yeah. um, plan just to ensure people keep to safe speeds. I mean, there is a challenge with multiple roadwork sites around the city and people not paying attention yes. to temporary signs. That's yes. an industry-wide challenge. Yes. Um, so the contractors are looking at other mechanisms. You would have, or you may have seen the, the different signs. Yes. My grandma works yep. here. and um, So they, they look at different tools to try and, and engage with drivers and get them to understand that the temporary speed limit's there for a reason. And there was a, it is quite a long site too, so I suppose it has its own challenges. Um, and I had a question uh, around traffic patterns. There's a section in here on um, item number 24 about traffic counts. Um, I was in town at the weekend and um, I'm not aware of anything particularly special going on that would have caused the amount of traffic, but I was, I noted that traffic was spilling over into intersections at the lights and there was gridlock on a Saturday, sort of um, in the middle of the day, which surprised me. Will those counts help you to work out and understand why that's happening? I mean, we hear about it happening during the week, but I was really surprised on a, on a Saturday. Yeah, look, the counts are, mm -hmm. um, are very important for us just to understand how, how people are using the network. And so you would have seen in there, we've, we've just entered into a new contract <coughs> to uh, get better data. So it's been a little bit random over time, whereas the team now have looked at exactly where they would want those counts to try and better um, inform us where people are moving. Uh, and that, that can then be used, it, it can be used for signals. Um, I mean, there's, we can do different counting, counting at signals with cameras and other things. Um, these counters are more just general traffic movements on the network, but it certainly helps us to understand how many people are driving and, and where they're coming from. And my final question, um, item 18. Um, obviously there was a major issue there. I mean, that would, would that be pretty unusual? Contractors' vehicles blocking the footpath and cycleway, forcing pedestrians yeah. and cyclists into the live lane. Yeah, that, that's uh, very unusual. That, that's a, not a good situation where people are being forced into a live lane, and, and the, the contractor certainly acknowledged that, and it was it was rectified very quickly, but it shouldn't have happened to start with. So, is there any kind of consequence for them in doing that? There, there is. So, the the traffic management um, controller can be subject to restrictions on further work and. Um, so we, we work through that with the contractor and also with um, NZTA. Okay, thank mm. you. Councillor Elder. Thanks, Kate. Um, just a couple of questions really um, to do with um, the mud tanks. I was just, um, one of the concerns in South Dunedin is that the autumn leaves fall mm. and, and, and um, accumulate at a certain period. Do you um, clean the mud tanks at that time? So is there a programme maintenance around the Yeah, so the contract includes um, an increased level of service over autumn to account for the leaf drop, and the, the contract is based on their just knowledge of the network. Um, we'll send out additional resources to deal with um, uh, leaf drop during autumn, so we do, we do respond to it. And is, is there any, any comms to, say, local people, how they might deal with, say, if they see a whole lot of leaves on there? <laughs> <laughs> I 
don't do what Mike said. Um, <laughs> so no, look, we do. Whenever we have um, heavy rain, we we certainly send out messaging just about clearing. You know, if you if you notice the the top of the grate is uh, covered, then clear it and and pull it back off onto the footpath um, rather than leaving it sitting in the drain. Uh, so there was there was you know previously where we've had significant uh, flooding or surface water issues, those messages have gone out fairly regularly. Oh, cool. Mm. Thank you, Councillor Lord. So I did have two other questions. One of them was: Have you had any feedback? Um, I, I've just noticed that particularly on Church Street in Mosgiel, you've got a new roundabout there, and you've got another one that's um, I'm not sure what the street is, but it's between Forbury uh, by the Waterloo Hotel and Caversham. And both of those, I think, are an improvement, but... Thorn Street. Thorn Street, the uh, intersection, yeah. Um, actually, I did know that. Um, I just wondered, have you had any uh, feedback, either positive or negative? I know the first time or two you use them, sometimes you do a bit of a double take, but then you get quite confident. Mm -hmm. Well, I think o overall the um, feedback's been very positive. We did receive some um, some uh, criticism from them at the start, and the, the lesson we took out of that is... Um, unlike traditional roadworks where it takes a while to do the concrete and, and you know the asphalt, those new roundabouts can go in overnight. So the contract, you drive through one day and there's nothing there and you drive through the next day and there's a roundabout there. And so we've, we've taken some lessons from that about the amount of signage we put up and how long we leave it there for, because normally it would just stay up during the construction period. Um, but the construction period in these cases can be one night, two at the most. Um, so some people aren't, aren't getting used to that change while the contractors are there, as they would with a traditional piece yeah. of work. So we'll, we'll make sure that in future that we um, leave that signage in for longer to just give people an awareness that the, um, the road layout's changed. But certainly the function of the roundabouts uh, from the feedback we've received has been very positive. No, that's good. And the other question I just had, um, and I'm just thinking it's in relation to, well, paragraph six and seven, I guess, but um, I'm thinking about School Road North um, out on the Tauri. Um, there's an area there where the road has been cut up really badly and they've been... Um, s Milner's uh, Road, at the end of Milner's. Oh, Milner's Road, yeah. Mm. There's been signs out there for... And, and uh, they've sort of had a false repair and they've had a fix and then it's crapped out again and... It just seems to be dragging on for an incredibly long time for what should be a reasonably straightforward repair. And I'm wondering, is, is, that, is there any reason why the contract is not doing it? Is it? Is it being waylaid because you have had greater priorities? Or it's just between White Road Lodge and... and yeah, look, I don't, I don't know the site specifically, but there, yeah. we have got a few instances where through priorities and, um, and resourcing that they haven't got to them within the season where we'd like them to. Um, in which case they probably are under a temporary fix. So the priority for those repairs is uh, given to the sites that are going to be resealed within the sealing yeah. season. Um, and if it's not up for reseal, then it just falls into the general maintenance category, which is not a reason for them not to do it. And that's what we try yeah. and work through with the contract. Judging by the time this, um, the signs have been out and the arrows and the cones have been out, I would imagine there's three separate seasons. You could have done them in summer, spring or autumn now, but it's, um, it's, it's getting to the stage where it's becoming fast school. I actually happened to come across late at night a couple of weeks ago a guy that had the cones had blown over and he'd run over the top of one and made a mess of the front of his car and yeah this, so people are they're causing problems yeah but thank you if you could chase that. Thank you uh, Councillor Wiley. Uh, thank you um, I had a question around the roundabouts too so I'll move on that one. Um, Mud tanks, just touching base on Councillor Elder's question. Um, looking around the streets when I'm walking my dog at night and picking up dog poo, the um, making sure, yeah, biodegradable bags, <laughs> good. <laughs> okay. Um, is there uh, any more, are they spray painting the tanks still as they clean them so residents can identify if the tank's been cleaned? Uh, no, they're not. So they did that uh, when we had committed to do a full clean of every tank. That was the way of tracking that. Now they're just on a um, cyclical clean um, when they, uh, but they don't they don't mark them at the end of that. They're just using the knowledge they've got from how full they were last time and every time they've been inspected since, and we'll just travel around the network. So it's really up to residents just to do a visual look um, and go from there, and then uh, call CSA. Yeah, if, they if see. they've got concerns, then yeah, the, the appropriate things to call um, call CSA. Okay, thank you, Councillor Hall. I noticed that um, 
you were saying about cleaning leaves, yeah, asking to pull them onto the footpath. I noticed a lot of the people are pulling them up the channel or down the channel. So as soon as it rains again, they're straight back into it. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, look, it's difficult because on the footpath they can be a hazard, a slip hazard as well. So, um, you know, there's no, they could they could drag them in and compost them. They um, we do know that after a heavy rain, most of the leaves that are on the roads will end up collecting at one tank or the other. So it does make it easier for our contractors to go and clean them out. But there's no easy solution for for the public. Mm. Councillor Gary. Thank you. I'm not sure whether this is for you, Mr. Saunders or Mr. Drew. But, um, le and you might not be able to answer it, lessons learned from this contract as we approach the next contract, would one of those be around the timeliness of response? Uh, yeah, look, that, that's always a challenge. Um, certainly um, within this contract, yes, uh, there's, there's a significant amount of work and the ability for the contractor to juggle everything we're asking them to do um, and, and how they prioritise a call from a customer versus some routine work versus something that one of our staff might have asked for and that's something that we continually need to try and get that balance right within any new contracts. Mm. Any other questions? You're willing to move, thank you, Councillor Lord. Councillor Hall? Do you wish to speak to that motion? Okay, anyone else wish to speak to it? All in favour, please say aye. aye. Against, carried, thank you. Thank you, Mr Saunders. Mr Henderson, well done in your new occupation. Come back to the area that's safer. Do you want to make a comment on that? <laughs> no Mr Henderson, do you want to speak to your report or you take it as read and take questions? Your choice. Uh, through the Chair, thank you. One, one small amendment I suppose I should mention, paragraph 16. It actually mentions the council update report to on 30th of April 2019, which technically is outside of the uh, yes. this time span of this report. Thank you. That's fine. Apart from that, happy to take questions. Thank you, Councillor Hawkins. Yeah, thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, um, Mr. Henderson. Um, hard to know that it was a promotion or not in the newspaper <laughs> the other day. But um, it's, uh, my questions around the locations for public places recycling, and they've all been fairly obvious who the catchment is in the places so far. I'm, I'm just interested in, besides from there being land available, what, what is the catchment that the countdown site is aiming to serve? Uh, I haven't actually got that data with me, but there is a, uh, in that sort of area of town, we, we, we've basically gone to the, uh, the rating database and some other information and there is um, uh, we have a map that we're working to which has actually basically got the number of residential uh, flats or apartments or houses etc in certain areas and we're trying to target putting one in each of those areas as we go so there is a uh, I can give you the exact catchment for that area but I know it, there is uh, some residential living in that area that it's within about 200 250 meters of that site yeah, thanks. I mean, I don't, I don't need the exact figures, but just just clarifying that it's working backwards from the same criteria that we've used to identify other ones in the central city, i.e. A, a critical mass of residents living in that area. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a critical mass, and then obviously that runs into the barrier of trying to find someone who's actually, uh, that we can find some space to actually put one in. So it's sort of like a compromise position, but it is in the targeted area. Yep. Great. Thank you. Councillor O'Malley? Um, it's to... Question 20, uh, paragraph 28, the uh, waste minimisation grants. Um, we've got the small project grants of $500, which obviously are useful to those who can use that kind of money, but would you agree that's not going to be a massive grant for people who are trying to do something business-wise? Uh, no, no, those ones aren't intended for businesses. Those ones are sort of more around the, those $500 grants are more around someone that wants to um, yeah put a compost bin somewhere or they do a worm farm at a school and that kind of thing. It's more targeted at those at, at schools and that sort of area just to give them an option. Yes. Yeah, so as we go forward with the waste minimisation and management plan and we look at the concept of bringing in um, businesses that can be involved with this plan, well, with our own waste futures, 
What, what funding mechanisms do we have that are in place that could assist in that way? There is a, uh, there's three levels of grants. There's the, um, uh, the small projects grant, the community-based sort of group grant, and then we do have a $40,000 into lots of $20,000 each year for um, businesses uh, to apply. So there's, there's $40,000 all up as a the large grant, for want of a better word, which is available to business. So that, I'm just clarifying that. So then our, the city's response to developing business it's not a criticism, we're just getting it clear. It's 40,000, right? We don't have anything more than that. Uh, not specifically out of the waste minimisation grants, although there is a, um, I probably will be thinking about a report in the not too distant future to increase that level of funding, uh, because I personally don't think the, the medium sized grant, which is a maximum of 10,000, 5,000 grant, sorry, um, is probably, when the grants were originally created, that was probably a, an, an enough a level of funding, but I don't think it is now. Kept up with inflation. I don't think it's kept up with, with the pace and with inflation, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, really great to see the mention of tertiary in here in a number of ways. Um, I just wondered about the um, promotion of the free household battery recycling. How well promoted is that? How well understood is that that, that facility is there, do you think? Um, it's, well, it, it's not because it's a drop-off service, et cetera, so it's not, it's, it hasn't really been pushed that, that terribly hard at this point in time. Um, it's basically been a, almost a trial at this point just to see how much of an impact it's having. Um, where we've had a, the huge impact, the huge difference hasn't been in things like TVs, et cetera, which we used yes, to get yeah. very few of. Um, yeah. So it's uh, obviously changing and subsidising that sort of thing is actually having a desired effect. Um, what I'd like to see in our future model is um, there's some, not particularly in New Zealand, but overseas, you, they actually have like a, a secret squirrel satchel that goes in your recycling bin, and you can put things like um, uh, old mobile phones or household batteries and that kind of stuff in a satchel which goes in, the, in your recycling bin. When that gets to the recovery facility, it's pulled off the, the belt, um, and that just makes it an easy system. But uh, we haven't got that in place and it would need a bit of an upgrade to the recovery facility. Um, but that just makes it easy for everybody to access that sort of recycling system. That's really interesting. Thank you. And finally, um, I was just wanting to clarify item 27, sustainable living workshops. Um, I just, are these similar to what was run before and Dr Maureen Howard ran those throughout the city? Is that the same kind of workshop we're talking about? Because they were hugely successful. Yeah, it is that kind of thing, Brilliant. yes. Yep, Excellent. Right. Thank you. Councillor Elder. Uh, just a quick question about um, the university and how it's looking. Have you had any feedback about the tidiness of the streets and waste management around that area? Um, actually, no, I haven't seen a cleanliness report for a couple of weeks, actually. Normally the um, Property Services Division of the University send us a report, uh, should be once a week actually, but since they've, um, they've restructured over there quite recently and it doesn't appear to be anybody actually doing that job. Thanks for reminding me, actually. <laughs> So you haven't got any anecdotal um, evidence that things have improved somewhat? Uh, our um, city custodian does do regular checks uh, himself through there, and uh, obviously the transport um, Richards guys also check through there fairly often. So my understanding is that there seems to have been quite a, a lift uh, in cleanliness through that area um, in the last six, 12 months. That, I think, is consistent with the tertiary cleanliness group that reports to the tertiary pr planning precinct group as well, which we had a meeting a few weeks ago. Thanks. Thank Councillor Hawkins. Sounds like a great group to be a part of. Um, yeah. My question is following on from Councillor Gary's around the e-waste stuff, because I saw that, noticed that too, it's great that it's free to drop off batteries, but you've still got to get to Green Island to do that. So in the, in the planning work Not around free. the waste futures stuff, is it free to do batteries? Household batteries. Oh, yes, you can drop off household batteries for free at Grand Island. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's, no, in the, yeah. it's in the report. Yeah, no. um, are we looking at what urban or suburban drop-off collection points might be to feed into that, in, in which may increase the likelihood that people would take up that free service? Uh, as part of the, the larger Waste Future projects, as we go forward... <coughs> excuse me, sorry about that. Um, Sorry, my apologies. 
Um, uh, and yeah, we haven't got into the details yet, but I, I think one that's one of the objections that we quite often get about the transfer station at Green Island is that it's all the way out in Green Island and there's nothing closer. Um, I personally firmly believe that there should be at least an additional two transfer stations actually in the CDBD area itself, which would then enable people to take advantage of that sort of uh, thing. Um, but we're not at that stage yet, and I can't tell you that that's, that's what's going to happen. But it is, it is part of the, uh, what's been looked at, yeah. Thank you. Um, well, following up on that, is it free to do it at Cargill's? Because they... No. And that seems an inconsistency, but the, do they go to Cargill's to do the... Yes, yeah, so we are subsidising the recycling out of the waste levy funds that we receive. Uh, which is obviously collected from the landfill. So we're using our, part of our waste levy funds to subsidise that recycling. If you go to Cargill's, you'll get charged, I believe, six, $6, $6 a kg. Yeah. So, and, yeah. And this is why I was getting slightly confused. So why wouldn't you do that at Cargill's for free as well and uh, cover it, that cost for them? We have to pay Cargill's, so we're, we're subsidising. So Cargill's, obviously, we don't control what, they, what they're charging or what they're doing, but we're subsidising... Anything that's collected at the landfill, we're paying for that recycling for the batteries. Yes, we take them to Cargill's. Yes. Yeah, but, and, and, and you pay Cargill's, but if someone takes them directly to Cargill's, which is presumably slightly more energy and effective for people in South Dunedin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we yeah. have had that conversation with Cargill's, but they... Um, well, congratulations. Yeah. Congratulations to all using Cargill's, though, on the other hand, uh, <laughs> consider, compared to some other communities. Um, the other question I had is, um, I don't know if anyone watched uh, Sunday last night, Miriama Kamo's presentation on um, taking the, she's had a five months challenge of reducing waste. It was a very good presentation. Um, yeah, and I, it just, it occurred to me having seen that, that do we, we do the workshops, but do we lift it to the stage where we get people to challenge themselves to reduce their waste in a um, sort of competitive way? In a competitive way, no, yeah. no, we don't. We do. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. people do a lot of things competitively quite well. Mm. Uh, no, at the moment, it's, it's more based around the fact that we, we run the workshops, et cetera, and then we mm. get follow up um, uh, surveys with these people to see if it's actually led to um, long term behaviour change. But no, we don't have any, uh, we don't um, have any competitive nature to it, no. Mm. It's a very good programme, thank you. Any other questions? Any, I'm happy to move, noting the report. Seconded, Councillor O'Malley. Any discussion? Councillor Lord, we just got an itchy aye. hand today. <laughs> All in favour, please say aye. 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 Against, carried, thank you. Thank you, Mr Henderson. Mr Dyer, without trophy. Welcome. Uh, so while you're sitting down, um, uh, uh, Councillor Sedman had noted his to the um, to Sharon Bodeka, and so I'm going to accept that for the noting on the records. I hope you don't mind. If any concerns it should have been in there. Mr. Dai, well done. Uh, I saw a nice photo of you accepting an award on Friday. Do you want to tell us about that first? Is good news? Uh, yeah, sure. So on Friday night, the Otago branch meeting or the Otago branch AGM and awards dinner for the Civil Contractors New Zealand um, Association um, uh, was held in Monica. Uh, I attended. Uh, we put a joint uh, nomination in for the Ross Creek Dam Renewal Project with Downer uh, and it received the top award, which was... Uh, uh, Best project over $5 million, I think, um, which was good. Well done. Congratulations. Excellent. Uh, now, do you want to talk to your report or just take questions? Uh, just straight to questions. OK, Councillor Benson Pope. Well, congratulations on that award. And I have a question about Ross Creek. <laughs> um, the um, the ru rubble face on the, on the dam is there any plan to revegetate that, or is it part of its operational need to keep it looking like um, the result of a volcano? <laughs> um, it is useful from an operational perspective to not have vegetation on the dam face, um, uh, and we we actually we have a plan in mind for that. Um, so under the, we've been looking to try and execute the. Um, uh, 
uh, art and infrastructure policy for some time, um, and we've been through tender process, or not the tender process, but an expression of interest process with a bunch of artists for um, uh, deploying um, something uh, visually appealing and um, uh, and something that fits with that environment um, on the on the dam structure itself. Um, we uh, all, so the concept, um, we've worked through with a whole bunch of stakeholders um, and, and some real positivity about it. Um, the concept is around um, uh, a, a mirroring um, concept. So the artist put the concept through saying, well, the dam uh, in, in almost all circumstances provides a mirror of what's, what's above. Um, and so they would, the artist was looking to transfer that to the dam face itself. So as a result, they're looking to put uh, basically representations of all of the constellations um, uh, on the face of the dam uh, and quite large um, steel stars, um, uh, about 72 all up, I think. Um, uh, we've worked through this in detail with Naitahu and there'll be some, um, uh, a whole bunch of, um, uh, information boards and that sort of thing, um, showing what those constellations mean um, uh, in, in a multi context as well. Well, that's helpful, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Councillor Gary. Um, yes, Mr Dyer, I just wondered if you could um, talk a little bit about um, the drinking water complaints, and in particular, we're obviously still looking at the media, we obviously still have people in the Mosgill community who don't understand why and how we made the decision around um, switching over to the supply from the unfluoridated supply? Um, I think most of the interested parties in Mosgill understand the decision now. Some are just less pleased with it um, and primarily around, uh, the prim primary displeasure is around um, the addition of um, fluoride to the drinking water supply. And that's not, um, it's not an uncommon complaint. Um, it also exists within the city and all of that sort of thing. Um, the addition of fluoride in Mosgill um, has come about through um, sending water over from our main water treatment plants that have been fluoridated for uh, many decades. Um, so you we, do believe that people do understand why we had to make yeah, the yeah, decision uh, in the most part? We, we've spent quite a bit of time focusing on that, um, especially around when that decision was made, and um, mm. we put quite a lot of effort into making sure that there was as much information out there as possible, and where it was felt that there wasn't. Um, I personally did quite a bit of touring around and visiting people. And that, that was the impression I had. I just yeah. was surprised at the recent publicity which suggested that perhaps there was a lack of understanding, but it's around yeah. the displeasure. Um, my second question was around Ross Creek, and I was interested in item 31 where it talks about the very, very gradual refill. Can you speak to that? Uh, yep, so it's common practice under any... Um, uh, um, when you're, when you're putting a dam back into service, it's common practice to lift lift that dam slowly and mm -hmm. monitor the conditions and make sure that you don't see any slumping or um, mm -hmm. uh, holes in the dam or anything like that. Um, uh, so we, we'd lift it up, let it settle, um, and then lift okay. it up and let it settle again. Um, so we're, we're nearly at the end of that process. Um, uh, quite a significant monitoring requirement from both staff and contractors. Um, and all's gone well so far. Sorry. And all all has gone well so far? All has gone well so far. Right. We had a couple of um, uh, things happen during construction that would suggest that there was potentially some risk as we lifted it, um, but we've been pleasantly surprised. It's, it's all, the dam structure is, um, is all um, puddle core clay, so um, it does respond to water over time, um, but no, things have been good so far. Great, thank you. Well done on the award. Councillor Wiley. Uh, thank you. Um, Mr. Dyer, quick question uh, on paragraph seven and eight, but mostly relating around eight. Um, the services provide to approximately 107,000 residents and 106 trade customers. What is the capacity? So looking at our housing pressures and um, development and things like that, it's... Um... Um, that is a very broad question. Um, uh, there is quite a bit of additional uh, capacity within uh, most of our trunk and um, more significant infrastructure, um, but we do have localised in capacity um, at different fringes of the network. So um, a good example would be um, North East Valley. We, we would struggle to accept 
much more wastewater, um, uh, especially in high ro rainfall events. But um, uh, but the trunk infrastructure downstream is largely um, is largely fine. Um, so localised projects will be able to um, uh, open up that capacity over time. Um, as you all know, um, Dunedin was a pretty low growth city for a fairly long period of time, and um, we've uh, you know. Most of our expectations have been exceeded in the more recent term. Um, so we're just going through a process now of, of changing our planning focus to one of a city of growth rather than um, uh, rather than not, um, which means uh, looking back at all of the projects that we've got in our list and applying um, a more significant growth apportionment to them um, and also looking at the capacity of those projects under um, some more, um, I guess, some gross predictions that might take into account what we've seen in the last couple of years. So, for example, um, looking at a vision of saying in 2050 we could have a population of 250,000 and the capacity that would have to go along with that sort uh, of growth? So there'd be some significant work required if, if that was the case. Um, but uh, but at this stage, we, you know, under most, um, even our upper growth scenarios, is. Um, for instance, within um, our water supply network, we have um, two water treatment plants that are broadly capable of servicing the bulk of the city. Um, uh, so therefore, redundancy. Um, so that redundancy can be used to accommodate growth over time in the near term. And if, if the council decides to apportion more redundancy in the future, then, um, then that's something we'd be able to do. But we have um, time to plan for growth in that big strategic context. Okay, um, and paragraph 30, uh, the sand sausages at uh, Sinclair. Um, so some more work was done on them a couple of weeks ago. Um, we've had some pretty big seas. How are they holding up? Uh, they, they have um, been tested pretty heavily over the last week. Well, we've had probably our longest period of significant swell um, uh, that they've faced so far. Um, the, the sand levels have certainly been the lowest that they've been since those um, since that structure has been installed. Um, we did have two of the small tow bags um, uh, fail completely, um, and they, they were reinstated. We've also um, put it's efficient once you've got a contractor on the beach to um, uh, to get them to prepare other bags and that sort of thing as well. So we, um, uh, we've, we've got an extra three sitting there waiting for, for others that might fail in the future. Um, it's important to note that we've gone from quite um, long turnaround times in terms of being on the beach and reinstating anything. Uh, I think last last year was, it was something more like three months. Um, this time it was, it was less than a week before we were on the beach and had that structure reinstated. So we're, we're learning, we're getting better, faster, um, uh, but uh, I expect that over the rest of the winter is probably going to be a little bit more maintenance required. And the edges are holding up quite nicely um, on either end? Uh, yep, so the the end uh, where the boat ramp is um, down against the seawall um, took... Quite a hammering? Quite a hammering, um, but um, with the, the setup that's there at the moment is, um, is quite easy and easy to reinstate. It's sort of designed to break down a little bit and then be put back in place. Um, uh, it would be nice if it wasn't happening, but it's one of our realities. And I noted the um, in some places there, in the toes, are, um, poles have been driven in to hold the toes in play. Do you yeah. see more of that work being done? Because it looked like it was quite a good result. Uh, yeah, um, it, it's quite an expensive intervention, um, but um, we'll, we'll just monitor and continue to look and if, if those bags start to move out again and um, we may consider further on the beach we may consider that as an approach but um, it's got significant drawbacks as well so it's, it's kind of a decision we wouldn't necessarily take too lightly. Thank you Chair. Um, Tom I was walking my dog along the beach and I saw a young man measuring the sand behind um, the sand dunes, the initial sand dunes, and I was just wondering, um, can you tell us a wee bit about how much sand is moving into behind the first line of sand dunes? Um, so over time we've seen a little bit of sand build up on that steep dune face behind the um, behind the sand sausages, but having that big structure in front isn't conducive to allowing sand to move back up naturally. Um, so we haven't seen a, a really significant level of deposition. Um, I 
but at oh, St Kilda. The, yeah, yeah, and with the, St Kilda the notches. Yeah, so with the notching um, there, we have seen quite a significant deposition over time. That That's working quite well. Um, costs the city about $4,000 a year to um, go and continue those notches, but we're seeing depositions of sand that are significant in the scheme of the sort of coastal erosion equation. Mm, that's really positive. Thank you. Any other questions? I've got Councillor Lord moving, seconding, thanks Councillor O'Malley. Any, do you want to speak to your motion? Thank you. All in favour, please say aye. aye. Against, Gary, thank you. Thank you for your, the final matter is items for consideration by the Chair. Thank you, Councillor Hawkins. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Just um, following on from the discussion around Albany Street, I think it might be helpful for staff in response to the OUSA referendum to make contact with them directly to mm -hmm. talk through where we were at and the monitoring that will happen after Dundas Street reopens and what the longer term safety project might look like there. Thank you. We'll do. Thank you for your attendance. Drive safely.